Good morning to all of you. And let me first of all thank Lady Lynn de Rothschild, if I may say, and the Inclusive Capitalism Initiative for convening all of us today. I would also like uh, to recognize the great civic leaders with us today. And first of all, indeed, His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, President Clinton, and Fiona Woolf, Lord Mayor of the City of London. We are all here this morning to discuss inclusive capitalism. And when Lynn sent me the theme, I thought only Lynn could convene such a room on such a theme. Because what is inclusive capitalism? We may thank His Royal Highness for giving us the backbone of what it should be the environment within which it prospers or that it destroys. But what is inclusive capitalism? So let's go back to etymology and a bit of history. Etymology, capitalism, comes from Latin, like so many other things. Caput was the initial one. Cattle head that you count to determine your wealth. Capital was then first used in the 12th century to refer to funds that could be managed, lent. But the word capitalism was first used in 1854 by an Englishman, the novelist William Thackeray, and he simply meant private ownership of money. Everything seems to have been invented by Englishmen. All sports, for sure. But the consecration of capitalism came a lot later, in the mid of the 19th century. And it was indeed Karl Marx who focused on the appropriation of the means of production and who predicted, obviously in the capital, who predicted that capitalism in its excess carried the seeds of its own destruction and did so because of the accumulation of capital in the hands of a few, essentially driven by the accumulation of profit, not especially concerned about consumption, and causing as a result social chaos, and ultimately so many cyclical crises that capitalism would destroy itself. That's the description of Karl Marx. So back to Lynn. Isn't inclusive capitalism, as a result, an absolute oxymor? Or, more to the point, would it be the ultimate response to Karl Marx? And would it respond to his dear prediction that capitalism would actually destroy itself? And could capitalism actually be a true engine for global prosperity, not for a few, but for the many. If so, what should the attribute of inclusive capitalism be? Trust, opportunity, rewards for all within a market economy, allowing everyone's talent to flourish? Certainly, that is the vision. However, most recently, capital has been characterized by repeated crisis, and most lately by massive excess. Excess in risk-taking, excess in leverage, excess in opacity, complexity, compensation, and all of that led to massive destruction, destruction of value. It has also been associated with high unemployment, rising social tensions, and growing political disillusion. All of this happening in the wake of the Great Recession. One of the main casualties of all that has been trust. In leaders, in institutions, in the free market system itself. The most recent poll conducted by Edelman Trust Barometer, for example, showed that less than a fifth 
of those surveyed believe that government or business leaders would tell the truth on an important issue. Now, that is a wake-up call, because trust is the lifeblood of modern business economy. Yet, in a world that is more networked than ever, trust is harder to earn than to lose. Or to quote one of the participants today, if trust comes on foot, it lives on a horse or a Ferrari. It's a Belgian proverb, actually. <laughs> La confiance part à cheval et revient à pied. So the big question is, how can we restore and sustain trust? Well, first and foremost, by making sure that growth is more inclusive and that the rules of the game lead to a level playing field favoring the many, not just the few. Prizing broad participation over narrow patronage. By making more inclusive capitalism, we make capitalism more effective and possibly more sustainable. But if inclusive capitalism is not an oxymoron, it is not intuitive either. And it is more of a constant quest. You mentioned, Lynn, a journey. More a constant quest than a definitive destination. So what I would like to do this morning, as head of the IMF, is talk about the things that have tasked the IMF to work on which it hadn't done much work or more research on previously. One is inclusion in economic growth. And the second one is integrity in the financial system. Those are not new subjects, but certainly not the one that are typically associated with my institution. So let me begin with economic inclusion. One of the leading economic stories of our time and uh, whatever the actual numbers, or rather the sort of very, very marginal debate that occurs at the moment, on the front page of some of our good papers. <laughs> so one of those leading economic stories is rising income inequality and the dark shadow it casts across the global economy. The facts are familiar, and I'm not just going to quote his numbers, I'm going to refer to other numbers. Since 1980, the richest 1% increased their share of income in 24 out of 26 countries for which we have data. In the US, the share of income taken home by the top 1% more than doubled since the 80s, returning to where it was on the eve of the Great Depression. In the United Kingdom, in France and in Germany, the share of private capital in national income is now back to levels last seen almost a century ago. And using some of the Oxfam numbers, the 85 richest people in the world who could fit into a single London double-decker control as much wealth as 3.5 billion people, that is, the poorest half of the global population. Now, with facts like these, with numbers like that, it is hardly surprising that not only the traditional groups associated with these issues are concerned, but also business leaders, policymakers, central bankers. Now, many would argue, however, that we should not be so concerned about the equality of outcome, but that we should focus on the equality of opportunities. Yeah, the problem is that opportunities themselves are not equal. Money will always buy better quality education, better quality health. But due to current levels of inequality, too many people in too many countries have only the most basic access to those services, if at all. The evidence also shows that social mobility is more stunted in less equal societies. Fundamentally, Excessive inequality makes capitalism less inclusive. It hinders people from participating fully and developing their potential. And disparity also brings division. The principles of solidarity and reciprocity that you see celebrated in many encyclicals from Leon XIII to our Pope 
Francis, that bind societies together are more likely to erode in excessively unequal societies. And history teaches us also that democracy begins to fray at the edges once political battles separate the haves from the have-nots. Greater concentration of wealth could, if unchecked, even undermine the very principles of meritocracy and democracy. It could undermine the principle of equal rights proclaimed in the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Pope Francis recently put it in stark terms when he called increasing inequality the root of social evil. So it is not that surprising that the IMF is doing some research into these matters. We looked at 173 countries. We have a membership of 188. So we looked at 173 countries for which we had reasonably reliable data over the last 50 years. And we found that more unequal countries tend to have lower and less durable economic growth. We went on the record on that point, and we have published. So much for the diagnosis. What can be done about it? We've also done some very recent work about it. We focused on the fiscal policy dimension, normal. IMF is mostly fiscal. That's our core business. And we found that, in general, fiscal policies have a good record of reducing social disparities. For example, transfers and income taxes have been able to reduce an inequality by about one-third, on average, among the advanced economies. Now, they are wonderful initiatives of the very wealthy deciding to give away most of their wealth and to only allocate a small portion of it to their succession. But failing those, fiscal initiatives are probably the second best to actually try to reduce inequalities. But it's a complex issue, and policy choices need to be made carefully, because fiscal discipline is often the first victim of political battlefield, and we obviously want to choose the measures that do the most good and the least harm. Some potentially beneficial options can include the following making income tax more progressive without being excessive, making greater use of property taxes, expanding access to education and health, relying more on active labor programs and in-work social benefits. But we have to recognize that reducing inequality is a very hard quest, because you end up having winners and losers. And the likely losers are those who have the biggest voice because they have the largest means, which is why, as His Royal Highness told us this morning, it takes courage and determination. It needs courage and determination in order to enable as many people as possible to participate and benefit from the economy. And it needs to be more inclusive. It means addressing income disparity, particularly when those disparities are extreme. So let me now turn to the second dimension of inclusive capitalism that I would like to address this morning, and that is integrity in the financial system. And it is not an oxymor to actually plead for this in the city of London, Madam Lord Mayor. It is not. But if we look at those surveys, the profession that is most hurt by diminished trust is the financial profession. They generally fall at the bottom of the list of those that are trusted and respected. We should not forget that the word credit derives from the Latin word for trust. Now, we are all familiar with the factors behind the crisis financial sector that nearly collapsed because of excess, a sector that, like Icarus in its hubris, flew just a bit too close to the sun and then fell back on Earth, taking the global economy down with it. We can trace the problems to the evolution of the financial sector before the crisis. Financial actors were allowed to take excessive risks, 
leading to a situation whereby the profits on the upside went to the industry and the losses on the downside, a couple of years later, were picked up by the public. Some of the greatest problems, still outstanding today actually, lay with the so-called too big to fail firms. In the decade prior to the crisis, the balance sheets of the world's largest banks increased by two to fourfold. With rising size, naturally came rising risks and not rising capital. Lower capital, less stable funding, greater complexity, more trading. If anything was inclusive, it was the various métiers of the bank. That kind of capitalism was more extractive than inclusive. The size and complexity of the mega banks meant that in some ways they could hold policymakers to ransom. The implicit subsidy that they derived from being too big to fail came from their ability to borrow more cheaply than smaller banks, magnifying risks and undercutting competition. Now, however bad and however destructive it was, the crisis has prompted a major course correction, with the understanding that the true role of the financial sector is to serve, not to rule, the economy. Its real job is to benefit people, especially by financing investment and thus helping with the creation of growth and jobs. As Winston Churchill once remarked, and I quote, I would rather see finance less proud and industry more content. The good news is that the international community <clears throat> has made progress on the reform agenda. This is especially true for banking regulation under the auspices of the Financial Stability Board, the Basel Committee, and we're moving forward with stronger capital and liquidity requirements. It should certainly make the system safer sounder and hopefully more service oriented. The bad news is that progress is still much too slow and the finish line is still too far off. Some of this arises from the sheer complexity of the task at hand. Yet, we must acknowledge that it also stems from fierce industry pushback and from the fatigue that is bound to set in at this point in a long race. A big gap is the too big to fail problem has not yet been solved. Recent study by the IMF shows that these banks are still major sources of systemic risk. Their implicit subsidy is still going strong, amounting to about 70 billion in the United States and up to 300 billion in the Euro area. So clearly, ending too big to fail must be a priority. Here I believe that the new capital surcharges for systemic banks can work. We have actually also added a little bit, and we've calculated that increasing the capital ratio on these banks by 2.5% beyond the Basel III standard can reduce the systemic risk of a trillion dollar That's a big deal. And I can just hear the whispering of bankers saying, out of their mind, another 2.5% in capital ratio? Mm. That's not the only issue. There's also the problem of contagion. And on the agenda should also be an agreement on cross-border resolution of mega banks, providing a framework to unwind them unwind them in an orderly way in case of failure. It's a hole in the financial architecture now, and it calls for countries to put the global good of financial stability ahead of their parochial concern. And it's not for failure of some to have tried. But we should not give up because it is hard. And borrowing from John Fitzgerald Kennedy when he was justifying significant budget to reach the moon, he said, we're going to the moon not because it's easy. We're going because it is hard. Same is true here. It is hard. We also need more vigor across the rest of the reform agenda. Better rules, 
for non-banks, monitoring of the shadow banks, better safety and transparency over derivatives, an area that is still today excessively obscure and complex. Again, it is too hard. No. To reduce the scope for contagion, I would like to see much more progress on cross-border issues. For example, in what has begun, which is the mutual recognition of rules for derivative markets. Again, this is complex and we need to be mindful of the risk of fragmenting the global financial system and hampering the flow of credit to finance investment. But complexity should not be an excuse for complacency and delay. If it fails down the road, how will we look like saying it was just too hard? As a former lawyer by background, I'm the first one to recognize that rules will not suffice and that their implementation will be key. It calls for what? It calls for greater resources, independence of the regulators and the supervisors, decent budgets so that they can actually operate and do their job. Regulation, adequate one, supervision, independent and properly financed, but that will not suffice either. Rules can affect behavior, certainly. Think of compensation practices, for example. We did a great job back in 2009. We formatted, we put threshold, limits. Bonus could not exceed a certain amount, but People who want to skirt the rules will always find creative ways of doing so. So we need to also turn our attention to the culture of financial institutions and to the individual behavior that lies beneath. And that's where you, each of you, actually can play a role and a decisive role. Incentives must be aligned with expected behavior and be made transparent. Here, the work of the FSB on principles for sound compensation practices commissioned by the G20 is instrumental to realign incentives with actual performance. But implementation must be pushed, must be adhered to at the highest levels, and trickle down the entire organization, including at mid-level, where there is always a tendency to say, well, we can find a way. We'll check with the lawyers. Why is it so important? Because if you look at it very carefully, the behavior of the financial sector has not, the behavior, has not changed so fundamentally in a number of dimensions since the crisis. Some changes in behavior are taking place, but they're not deep or broad enough. The industry still prizes short-term profit over long-term prudence, today's bonuses over tomorrow's relationship. Some prominent firms have even been tarnished in scandals that violate the most basic ethical norms. LIBOR, foreign exchange rigging, money laundering, illegal foreclosure, and so on and so forth. Sometimes by a handful of some, but they've been tolerated. So to restore trust, we need to shift towards greater integrity and accountability. We need a stronger and systematic ethical dimension because it will bear systemic consequences. Now we can turn to the ancient philosophers to wonder why are we doing all that? They would have asked what is the social purpose of the financial sector. Aristotle would have asked what is its telos? He answered his own question actually. Wealth, and I quote, is evidently not the good we are seeking, for it is merely useful and for the sake of something else. Tell us. Or as Oscar Wilde put it beautifully, the true perfection of man lies not in what man has, but in what man is. And from this perspective, we can identify the true purpose of finance. Its goal is to put resources to productive use, to transform maturity thereby contributing to the good of economic stability and full employment and ultimately to the well-being of people. In other words, to enrich the whole society. 
When we think about finance, surely one of these core virtues is prudence, which is about stewardship, sustainability, safeguarding the future. Prudence has long been a byword of banking and yet has been sorely missing in action in recent times. We know that regaining virtues like prudence will not happen overnight. Aristotle teaches us that virtue is modeled from habits, from developing and nurturing good behavior over and over and over. Practice makes perfect. Getting back on the right path will require leadership and education sustained over many years. It requires alert watchdogs, including from civil society. Most importantly of all, it requires investors and financial leaders taking values as seriously as valuation, culture as seriously as capital. As Mark Carney, one of the speakers today, pointed out in an admirable speech in Canada last year, the financial sector needs to be grounded in strong connections to clients and to communities, to the people served by the financial industry. Ultimately, we need to ingrain in greater social consciousness one that will seep into the financial world and forever change the way it does business. I have trepidation using the word forever because as Lynn indicated, it's a journey, it's a quest. And a quest is forever, the result is not there. We are seeing positive signs and clearly the event convened organized with such talent with extraordinary fairies around its cradle is one such good example. Pursuing practical ways to make capitalism an engine of economic opportunity for all. We can draw some parallels here with our expanding environmental consciousness, which owes a lot to His Royal Highness and other leaders who have taken this matter as seriously as it should. Not so long ago, look back, we didn't have that high level of awareness about the environment. Littering was commonplace. We were throwing things, not thinking about it. Today, we, our children, our grandchildren, are much more educated about these issues and more in the habit of respecting the planet. By comparison, the equivalent kind of awareness in the financial sector, the idea that private misbehavior can have a broader social cost is only at an early stage. It is akin to the initial period of environmental consciousness, which focused on banning of lead petroleum products. Just as we have a long way to reduce our carbon footprint, we have an even longer way to go to reduce our financial footprint. Yet we must take those steps. I realize with great humility that those are not the kinds of questions that either economists, sometimes policymakers, feel terribly comfortable talking about. Yet I also believe that the link is clear. Ethical behavior is a major dimension of financial stability. So let me conclude. The topic of inclusive capitalism is obviously a vast one. And I could have talked, not as eloquently though, as it was just talked about, about the environment within which, as I said, capitalism can either prosper or despair. I could have talked about the exclusion of women as agents of capitalism. I could have talked about corporate social responsibility. Yet I wanted to focus my remarks today on the behavior that continues to deplete the treasury of trust and could again destabilize the global economy. I wanted to talk about matters that the International Monetary Fund cares about and can contribute to. By way of conclusion, I would just like to submit that we're also working on env environmental issues, and I totally echo the call to action by His Royal Highness. And I don't think it is fair to say that it is too hard, it will require consensus, not all members will eventually agree. We have recently published a book on how to eliminate subsidies. It has a fiscal dimension, of course, but it has more importantly an environmental dimension. And it's a double win 
and it can be done. We've surveyed 27 countries that have done so and that have eliminated the incentive to consume fossil energy. We will soon be publishing a book about setting the right price, a very, very important question that leads to how we respect or destroy our environment. With all that, at the end of the day, when the global economy is more inclusive, the gains will be less elusive. And I can assure you, Lynn, that in this initiative, the IMF will be on your side. Thank you.